I feel honored to, uh, to be up here this morning, and I hope I can conduct myself in a manner that would be pleasing to the Lord and glorify Him, and that He may have some message for you in what I can deliver to you. I want to talk to you this morning, and I want to move forward and get out of Brother Kenny's way, but I want to uh, talk to you this morning about a, a, an event that all of you know of and aware of, and I, don't, I can't imagine there being anybody in this room that has heard of this story. It's a few verses in Luke, 10th chapter of Luke. It's about uh, the Good Samaritan. Now, everybody knows what the Good Samaritan is. I mean, everybody in the journey knows that's somebody who uh, has no obligation to you, but out of the compassion and the goodness of their heart, they go out of their way to help you when they don't owe you any duty, they don't have to. They're just doing it out of the goodness of their heart. We have laws in the state of Texas called Good Samaritan Laws so that if you're driving down the highway and you see somebody in despair, they've had a car wreck or they've been injured in some way, and you don't owe them a duty at all, you don't have to, but out of the goodness and compassion of your heart, you stop and help them. And we have laws because that way that if you're trying to help them and something goes wrong, you're not held responsible for that because you stopped only, you didn't have a duty, you didn't have an obligation to, but you stopped only to try to help them out. And everybody knows what that is, so... We know what the Good Samaritan is about, a man that stopped a man along the highway and took care of him. So we don't really need to read it, right? Well, let's read it this morning and see if it has a lesson in there for us. It's in the 10th chapter of Luke, and it begins with the 25th verse. But before we get started on that, I'm going to back up just a little bit, because what Jesus has to say in front of that is a little bit important. He is welcoming back, up in the 17th verse, he's welcoming back 70 disciples that he sent out to preach the gospel to them. He's welcoming them back, and they're coming back and giving him a good report. And he is talking to them, and he says in the 21st verse, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and of earth, that thou hast hid these things from the wise and the prudent, and hast revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for it seemed good in thy sight. Jesus has said, the Lord is revealing things to you, you that follow him, that study him, that he doesn't reveal to everybody. He doesn't reveal it to the people that are very wise or feel like they're wise or righteousness. But if you study the Lord and you, you come and you come to church and you read your Bible, he will reveal stuff to you that he doesn't reveal to other people. Verse 22, he says, All things are delivered to me of my Father, and no man knoweth the Son, who the Son is but the Father, and who the Father is but the Son, and them to whom he, the Son, will reveal him. We don't know God unless Jesus reveals it. You know, you got, they've got an exclusive little club going on here. Nobody knows the Lord except Jesus, and nobody knows Jesus except the Lord. And thank goodness he added on that last little deal, and those to whom he would really reveal. So we're dependent on the Lord to reveal to us not only the things of the Scripture, but to reveal to us even who the Lord is, and put himself in our heart and reveal things to us. So he's leading us up telling us there's a lot of things hidden that you get the chance to see that a lot of people don't get the chance to see. And then he turned to his disciples and said privately, Blessed are the eyes which see the things that you see. You're seeing things that a lot of people don't see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings have desired in these, to see in these times things which you see and have not seen them, and to hear things which you hear and have not heard them. He's saying, because you're a child of God, because he's put himself in your heart, he's showing you things that he doesn't show other people. And he's saying that right before we move into the story of the Good Samaritan. So I think it's important that we see what he followed that up with and what he's talking to us about sometimes some things that are hidden from the wise and prudent, but revealed unto us who try to study. We're the babes, we're the children. You know how a child is, a baby is. I've got a young grandson right now, and he's just a sponge for knowledge, everything he can learn and see. And at that age, you are. That's what we are. Once you start studying, you become a sponge. You want to study more. And he, when he does, he reveals it to you. And you'll see, you, y'all know me, y'all know why I like this also. And behold, a certain lawyer. Now, I've got all versions of the Bible. Brother Ron back there has helped me collect the Bibles. I love to collect Bibles, and he's helped me a lot. I've got the Revised Standard Version, the Good Bible, the, uh, the, even the Reader's Digest Bible. I've even got one, the Bible for Dummies. I've got all these books. You know, I have all the versions of them. 
This is what I like about the King James. It's not a version. We call it the King James Version, as Amanda is. It's actually the King James Translation. It is a word-for-word -word translation out of the original Greek that the Bible, the New Testament was written in. Old Testament in Hebrew, New Testament in Greek. It's a word-for-word -word translation. It's a perfect translation. You know, when they, it's not perfect. Well, they give you hands, they put things in italicies. When they're letting you know it's not perfect, but it's a word-for-word -word translation. For instance, certain lawyer, the word certain is not in any other uh, those translations. They take those things out. They take some words out. And I, I think that's important. Behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, and, uh, uh, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? What shall I do to inherit eternal life? Why is that tempting Christ? What's wrong with that question? Well, the question is internally inconsistent. And that's why he's tempting you. I'm tempting you. I've spoken this before, but there are two basic doctrines in the Bible. Two doctrines. You don't have to know, you think, all the doctrines of the Christian world. There's actually only two. There's Calvinism and there's Arminianism. Calvinism, we call it that because John Calvin wrote his interpretation of the Bible. He said we are saved by being predestinated. Now he went too far with it. He said we're predestinated. Everything we do is predestinated. All things are predestinated completely. And that's, he wrote extensively about it. Well, another guy disagreed with him named, named uh, Jacobus Arminius. And if you, he believed we're saved by our works, by the good things that we do. <clears throat> and he said that's what the Bible teaches. Uh, and that's why we're, this, this study is called Arminians. People who believe you're saved by work are Arminians. People who believe you're saved by predestination are called Calvinists. And these two, Bi these two doctrines are both taught in the Bible, but they hit it on. And people say you have to choose one or the other. You've got to be a Calvinist or you've got to be an Arminian. You can't be both. You hit them together. And that's what, look, what this question asked here. He said, <clears throat> Master, what shall I do? He's talking about eternal life. What shall I do? I got to do something to get eternal life. What do I got to do? Do I got to hear the gospel? Do I got to believe it? Do I got to accept it? Do I got to repent? Do I got to confess? Do I got to join church? Do I got to be baptized? Do I got to feed the hungry, clothe the uh, naked, you know, and take care of the poor? What do I got to do? I mean, that's an Armenian belief. What do I have to do to get eternal salvation? I got to go do something. One of those things, and depending on what church you are, they believe Armenian, they believe maybe it takes one or two or three of those lists that I gave off then. What do I got to do to get eternal life? Okay, that's, just, that's how he starts his question. It's an Armenian question. What do I have to do? Just give me a list. We all like, tell me exactly what I have to do. He says, what do I have to do? And he says, to inherit eternal life. Well, you know, Brother Kenny talked this morning about we've had some deaths lately. And, and when we talk about these things after someone has died, it's like, well, who is the heirs? Who inherits the person's property? Now, what do you have to do to inherit property? You don't do nothing. Somebody else has to die. But you don't do anything. There's nothing you can do. So the question is, what do I have to do to do something that I don't have to do anything to get? What do I have to do to get something that I don't have to do anything to get? It's an inconsistent, inconsistent question. He has asked him a question that takes these two doctrines and hits them head on to each other. Now we know the answer to that. We know that both are good doctrines. And the Old Baptists are the only church I know of that makes these two doctrines fit. I don't have enough fingers to make this work, but fit together like blood. They go hand in hand. They go together. They're both good, beautiful doctrines. Instead of dividing them, we ought to make them work together. That's rightly dividing the word of truth. We know that we are predestinated. God, before the foundation of the world, wrote your name's in the last book of life. That book is sealed. It won't be open until the end of time. And your eternal salvation is secure. You inherit it. It's given to you. It's a free gift of God. It's given to you. That's how we get our eternal salvation. Now, this book, though, the Lord has written for us who are living. And we live day to day. Now, how do we get through the day to day? Well, we've got to do things. We've got to study the Lord. We've got to go to church. We've got to believe in Him. We've got to pray to Him. When you do, He rewards that. God is the rewarder of those who diligently seek after Him. So that's the Arminian side of this. We do have to do something by coming to church by studying, by doing good deeds, by you know, you know helping the poor and the rich, and I'm helping the poor and the hungry, and those type of things, then the Lord will bless you for those things in time. He'll bless you today and tomorrow. That's the difference between time salvation and eternal salvation. You already know the ending of your story. It's great. It's wonderful. You don't have to get to the book, end of the book and read it. It's good. So he's asking him these conflicting questions. Which one's right? And he's going to see if he can twist up the Lord. 
Well, I'd rather be cross-examining anybody but the Lord. <laughs> anyway, that's that's what that's why the question is tempting. He's asking him inconsistent questions. You know, do I get saved? And he asked him about eternal life. Do I get saved eternally by my own works, or do I get saved by some something the Lord's done? Jesus, you know, he, he does. Jesus is a good answer here. He he can he can dodge a question better than anybody. He said, "What is written in the law? How readest thou?" Well, this guy's a lawyer. And that means he's a scribe. It means he wrote the law, he studied it, transcribed it, and that's what lawyers was talking about the law of Moses, the Ten Commandments, and all the laws of the Old Testament. What do you better do to get those? He said, "How do you read the law?" And the guy answers, verse twenty-seven: "Oh, thou shalt love the Lord with God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all, all thy strength, and that and love thy neighbor as thyself." He, he knows the law. He reads it off. That's what the law says we're supposed to do. And of course, Christ had just repeated that to them uh, just a little while earlier when he said, which, when he was asked, which of the commandments was the greatest? He said, well, there's only two. Love the Lord with all the heart, mind, soul, and love thy neighbor as thyself. So this guy already knows the answer, and he's repeating it. He says he knows the Jewish law well. <clears throat> and he reads it off, and Jesus says, well, thou hast answered right. Do this, and thou shalt live. He didn't say you get eternal life. He said you shall live. And the question was about eternal life. So Jesus said, you know, the law, you do the law. And that's what we do. If we follow the law, if we try to follow the Ten Commandments, if we follow the gospel, then we shall live good. And we're blessed in doing so. Jesus is leading him along here. But he, the attorney, willing to justify himself. He wants to justify himself. Of course, over the second chapter of Galatians, it tells us man cannot be justified by the law. You can't try to follow the law and justify yourself. Well, I remember the Pharisee that went to the temple to pray with the, with the publican, and he said, you know, I, I tithe, I, I observe the Sabbath, I fast, I do everything under the law. He didn't go away satisfied, he didn't go away justified. The poor person did and fell down and said, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. You can't be justified by the law, that's what he's trying to do. He's trying to stay within the law and justify himself. So he said, okay, who's my neighbor? He wants him to say, well, the Jewish people are. That's who you are. My Jewish friends are who my neighbor is. And Christ answering said, and then he gave this parable that we know is a good Samaritan. A certain man, again, certain is taken out of the other versions of this Bible. The true versions, they write their own versions, and they make it simpler to read. And like I said, I've read many of them. A certain man went, went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Now going to Jer Jericho, we look it up on the map or look it up and Google it and you study it, Jer Jerusalem is up in the mountain, right next to Mount Zion. It's in the mountain. You go down to Jericho, you travel, it's about 17 miles, 18 miles down to Jericho, and you travel through the canyons, and the, the path follows the canyon. they got a highway there now, you can drive it, but you can see the original Jericho Road. And it's a treacherous road, and it's got lots of curves, and it's perfect places for ambushes. That's the way it's described. It is the perfect place if you were going to rob somebody, you could camp out and rob them. So that's, that's the problem with Jericho. The Elvis Presley sang a song about the Jericho Road. Lots of history about the Jericho Road. He, he went down to Jerusalem, Jericho, and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. How do you be half dead? Dead is an absolute word. You're either dead or you're alive. You know, the old joke we used to make is about, you know, she's about half, she's a little bit pregnant. You're not a little bit pregnant. You either are or you're not. That's dead. You're either dead or you're alive. Except, remember back in Genesis when God says, Adam and Eve, who he who eateth the tree of the knowledge of, of good and evil, the day you eat thereof, there shall surely die. The devil came along and said, no, you're not going to die. Again, we're playing with words here. The devil was. Did Adam and Eve die? Yes, they did. They died spiritually that day. Now, they got their spiritual life back later. They were blessed. <clears throat> the Lord and we're all inherited that from Adam. We are all spiritually dead. This is a good comparison of us and our depravity. We are beaten. That's what happens to us in the world. We're beaten and robbed and left half dead many times if we follow the things of the world. This is many times the way we're found. Verse 31. And by chance. By chance. I don't want my salvation to be based on chance. But if I'm laying there in the ditch and I'm beaten and laying and half dead, I look up and it says and by chance there came down a certain priest. I'm going, oh good, a man of God is coming along, I can get saved. Good, I, I feel better 
I got a chance to be saved. And what happens to this man who's got a chance to be saved? A certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. That Jericho road, the road down Jericho was really a path. It was, you know, maybe about the width of this aisle, most ways. You almost had to step over somebody if they were laying down. So you're not going to miss somebody. It's not like these guys didn't see him. They did. By chance, along came a priest, and he passed by on the other side. I'm looking up, and I say, oh, good, a man of the cloth, a man of God. i got a chance to be saved here. You know, I had people tell me this. If I believe like you did, I, I can't believe that because I think everybody ought to have a chance to be saved. You know, I know what my how my luck is with chances. I, you know, everybody's been to Vegas or dealt with anything, you know, rolling dice or whatever. You know, your chances are not good. If you got a chance to be saved, you also got a chance to be lost. You got a chance to go to hell. <laughs> so chances, I, I don't want to rely on chances. And this this man here that was laying in the ditch found out the same way. It says, verse 32, and likewise, that means also by chance along came a certain Levite, another man of God. These two people know the law. A Levi and a priest, these represent the law because those were the two officers of the law. They were charged, as was their duty, to educate people on what the law was and tell them what the law was. So if you're relying on these people under the law, one of them had a chance, but it's good. i got a second chance now to be saved. Here comes a Levite, another man of God. What does the Levite do? And when he was... At the place, he came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. He actually stopped and looked at him and passed by on the other side and went on. <coughs> if I'm relying on chance and I'm laying down in the ditch, I just lost two of the best chances I would think by in terms of this world that I could ever have. Two great chances. And you know, the words here are dealing with time salvation. It's about a man who's alive and hoping to be saved. But we're about to see a picture of Christ here. And I want you, that's what we want to see. That's what we need to see that, that the Lord is telling us is in Scripture. In verse 33. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was and saw him, and he had compassion on him. A certain Samaritan who doesn't owe you any obligation. And to a Jew, the Jews hated the Samaritan. Samaritans, you know, they, they fought all the time. They didn't like Samaritans. Samaritans were those half-breed people who let their Jewish purity get away from them, get taken from them because they, they were taken over by the Assyrians and they intermarried with them and they lost their Jewish purity. That's the ten northern tribes that got invaded by Syria and lost. Those were Samaritans. The Jews hated them. They were half-breeds. We don't care for them at all. <coughs> it's interesting to see that we have two people come along here who were Jews but wouldn't save another Jew. But along comes the enemy, and he's the one that has compassion on him. And that's a true, that's a true Samaritan. It's a great lesson in life. It's a wonderful lesson in life, and that's what we take it for. It's also a spiritual lesson for us. You know, we sing this, you know, song, uh, uh, like I've lost the deal now, but it's just talking about a, not a friend we have in Jesus, but uh, I would see Jesus. I would see Jesus. When, down there it says, in <clears throat> they were his friends. They were once his foes. That's us. <coughs> we're we, we're treat Christ like you know. We don't want to have anything to do with him. We're not bothered. We don't be bothered by him till he puts himself in our hearts and wakes us up and makes us realize we are. He is our best friend. He is our good Samaritan. He has no obligation to save us, but he comes and he has compassion on us and takes care of us. And it says this. Now you know, with the parable. Don't try to jump at every little thing and put make meaning out of it, but see the big picture here. This man was not saved by the law, by the Jewish and the Levite priest who knew the law. They represent the law. He wasn't saved by the law, but he was saved by this person that should have been. He could, used to consider his enemy that comes along and saves him and has compassion on him. And he went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine. That's where in the, doc, in the Bible we know that Oil represents the Holy Spirit. Wine represents the blood. That's how we're saved. Timely, by the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the comforter of saves now. And the blood of Jesus Christ, the wine that he poured into him, we're saved by his blood eternally. Again, both of these good doctrines are combined together. They're fit together like a glove. He uh, poured oil and wine on him, set him on his own beast, and brought him to an end and took care of him. To an end. I like to think, say this is like the church. This is what the church is for, is to take care of the Lord's people.
takes care of us and gives us comfort and helps bind up our wounds. And that's why we have gathered together as an assembly because to take care of each other. He took him to the inn. And on the morning when he departed, he took out two pence, that's about two or three days' wages, and gave it to them, to the host, and said, Take care of him, and when whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I'll repay thee. He said, I want to pay for him now. I want to pay for everything he's done. All his wounds, all his sins, I'll pay for them all now. Now I'm going to go away for a while, but I'm going to come back. And if he sinned in between now and then, I'll pay for those two. Now that's a picture of Christ. Amen. That's what this is all about. It's a great story and a good Samaritan and the world knows it. But what he's telling us up here, you see things that other people don't see. You get to understand and he reveals stuff to you that he doesn't reveal to other people. And he said, now Jesus in turns and asks this lawyer, he says, now which, of, now, which of these thinkest thou was neighbor to, to him that fell among the thieves? And the lawyer, of course, he can't say the word Samaritan, but he said, well, <clears throat> he said, him that showed mercy on him. Christ has shown mercy on us. We don't deserve it. We weren't even his friend before he told us, put himself in our heart until he revealed himself to us. And now he real, reveals to us again. And that's what's taking place in the Bible. He's revealing it to his people. This Bible was written for you. It wasn't written, written to save souls. It was written to save those of us who are already saved. It's meant to minister to us. Not to save us. Save us timely. Yeah, but not save us eternally. It's to give us that timely salvation. That's how these two doctrines fit together. Jesus takes those people that are his, that he's, now he's written in the last book of life, and he's died for them, and he's taken care of you eternally. That's set, that's done. Like I said, you know the end of this story, and it's not just good, it's wonderful. And now he said, now in the meantime, I'm going to pour oil and wine on your wounds, I'm going to take care of you in a timely fashion. I'll get you through the times you've got now. Those of you that have lost loved ones nearby, and recently, it's important for that. It's important that you understand that they're better off now, and they will be better off again someday. Jesus concludes this with saying, he said, he and him that showed mercy on him, and Jesus then answered and said, Go and do thou likewise. That's what the church is for, is to take care of each other. That's where we, this church is the end, end that, that, that Jesus put him in. That's why he put the church here, is to take care of us until he returns again. It's a beautiful picture of our timely salvation and giving us the big picture that he already has taken care of us eternally. That's done and complete. But he'll come back again one day and pay for whatever else sins we've committed. Because you're a child of God, doesn't mean you're without sin. I hope that's true because I'm in trouble if it's not. But he's just a wonderful, beautiful picture of Christ. He is the ultimate Good Samaritan. I appreciate your kind attention. Brother Kenny, come and preach for us.